Chapter 9, Part B. Why and how the Constitution must be construed and applied according solely to its original intent, and how it has been misinterpreted, misused, and even perverted through such fallacious theories as the living Constitution. The need for members of CHSAs to be well-versed in constitutional law is absolute, because the very first function of the militia of the several states, the Constitution identifies, is to execute the laws of the Union, and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. If militiamen were ignorant of how to construe the Constitution correctly, they themselves could execute neither the supreme law nor any other laws of the Union based upon it for they would have no way of ascertaining for themselves what those laws actually were. Rather, they would have to follow someone else's interpretations and instructions. The Constitution, however, mandates that the militia are to execute the laws, and only the laws, not what unnamed others may mistakenly or maliciously tell them the laws are, out of error or even deceit, when the laws are not such at all. The duty of the militia to execute the laws being plenary, for the Constitution imposes no limitation or qualification on it, its performance must encompass their own decisions of all relevant questions of both fact and law. That is, in any doubtful case, the militia must ascertain for themselves what the laws are and what they actually command and then put that understanding and only that understanding into execution in light of the circumstances. They are not absolved from that responsibility because of some supposed superior in the normal chain of command, including even the President of the United States themselves, orders them to do what they believe on good authority is wrong, or what that superior cannot demonstrate is right. For a doubtful case by hypothesis, is not subject to the normal chain of command. A doubtful case creates the apparent dilemma. If the militia accede to the command of some superior that has no basis in the laws, they will aid and abet that superior in usurpation or tyranny. But if the militia refuse to obey the command of some superior that does have a basis in the laws, they themselves will violate the laws. The quandary is only apparent, however. For in the final analysis, the content of the laws is for the supreme legislators to decide. By our sufferance, we the people ordain and establish this constitution every day, because we enjoy the power to amend and therefore even to rescind it. And the power to enact carries with it final authority to declare the meaning of the legislation. Although perhaps entitled to deference, the contrary opinions of public officials on the subject are never controlling. For whenever a question arises between the society at large and any magistrate vested with powers originally delegated by that society, it must be decided by the voice of the society itself. There is not upon earth any other tribunal to resort to. Thus, in any doubtful case, we the people being the militia, and the militia being we the people, in the final analysis, the militia must determine for ourselves what the laws we are to execute truly command, allow, or prohibit. To do that, however, the militia, and prior to the revitalization, the members of CHSAs, must learn not only what the laws say, but also what they mean. That they can do so is an irrebuttable premise of constitutional law for two reasons. First, no one doubts that a statute which either forbids or requires the doing of an act in terms so vague that men of common intelligence must necessarily guess at its meaning and differ as to its application violates the first essential of due process of law. The Constitution is the greatest of all statutes. Unless it violates the first essential of due process of law, it cannot possibly be cast in terms so vague that men of common intelligence must necessarily guess at its meaning and differ as to its application. The militia of the several states are composed of men of common intelligence. Therefore, the militia can understand the Constitution by themselves. Second, as the preamble asserts, we the people do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America 
both in the late 1700s and today. Self-evidently, we the people could not ordain and establish something we ourselves do not fully understand. We the people constitute the militia. The people to whom the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear arms. Therefore, the meaning of the Constitution must be accessible to those Americans who enroll in the militia of the several states. They must also be familiar with the history of the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia. CHSAs will need to understand upon what legal foundations the militia rested, what composed them, how they organized and equipped themselves, the nature and extent of their responsibilities and functions, the problems they faced and how they overcame them, and especially why the totality of this experience defines once and for all the constitutional term, the militia of the several states. Specifically, what the Constitution guarantees to Americans with respect to their militia and why. The members of a CHSA must understand and be able to explain that when the Second Amendment declares that a well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, it asserts as a finding of historical fact and supreme law, conclusive on everyone subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, that constitutionally well-regulated militia are those, and only those, in which the people actually exercise their right to keep and bear arms and they must appreciate and be able to articulate how, in perfect harmony with the amendment, the original Constitution empowers Congress to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, thus guaranteeing that such well-regulated militia will always exist, because Congress enjoys no semblance of authority to disarm we the people ourselves, and the states cannot interfere with Congress's duty to arm the militia by disarming their own citizens who comprise their militia. The members of a CHSA must also understand and be able to explain that when the Second Amendment declares a well-regulated militia necessary to the security of a free state as a matter of constitutional fact and law, it conclusively defines a free state to be one with a well-regulated militia, and conclusively identifies the militia as the indispensable means to achieve security for a free state. And because a free state and a republican form of government are constitutionally inextricable one from another, the amendment identifies a well-regulated militia as requisite to a republican form of government too. Therefore, Congress's power and duty to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and the power and duty of the United States, doubtlessly exercised and fulfilled by and through the militia, to guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government, when invasions and domestic violence occur, are the true sources of effective homeland security from the general government. They must also understand the dangers that America faces from not revitalizing the militia. Examination of the history of the militia of the several states following ratification of the Constitution will explain why and how these establishments atrophied during the early 1800s and again following the Civil War, and then almost altogether disappeared in the 1900s to be overshadowed by the National Guard. This chronicle of deterioration offers a striking object lesson, especially instructive today, in what befalls Homeland Security when politicians ignore or evade the Constitution with we the people's acquiescence. Against this background, every member of every CHSA must become thoroughly familiar with the dangers now confronting America, and must know and be prepared to explain to citizens in general, and public officials in particular, why immediate revitalization of the militia of the several states is necessary to deal with them. Foremost among these dangers, how America is threatened by the steady elaboration of a centralized national police state under the guise of homeland security. Although no informed patriot doubts that this is happening, and few Americans desire it, only a very small number understands that the fundamental reason it can occur at all also points up to how it can be stopped. To a large degree, promoters of a national police state 
have been successful precisely because of the present atrophied condition of the militia of the several states. To wit, their demobilization by Congress and the states to the oxymoronic status of unorganized militia, with no organization, no arms, no discipline, no governance, no training, no statutory authority, and especially no specified role whatsoever in homeland security. Even though the Second Amendment expressly declares that a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state, and even though the original Constitution expressly identifies only the militia as the forces to be called forth to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, with the militia unavailable as a practical matter, the architects of and apologists for a police state have been emboldened and enabled to increasingly unveil the armed services into domestic law enforcement and to paramilitarize the professional police forces in every state and locality, transmogrifying them into satellites of the general government's police, investigatory, and intelligence agencies. Soon, too, these same plotters and propagandists may press for deployment within America of military and police detachments from foreign countries or international organizations such as the United Nations, so that Americans will find ourselves under the heels not only of native standing armies, but also of alien ones. Inasmuch as it is against sound policy for a free people to keep up large military establishments and standing armies in times of peace, both from the enormous expenses with which they are attended, and the facile means which they afford to ambitious and unprincipled rulers to subvert the government or trample upon the rights of the people, how much more dangerous, indeed positively demented, is it to cede control over any aspect of homeland security to foreign military establishments and standing armies? If the present moribund condition of the militia of the several states facilitates the erection of the national police state, their early revitalization can arrest its construction. Once the states have assumed the duty on which Congress has defaulted to organize, arm, discipline, and train their militia, no plausible argument will remain to employ the armed services and paramilitarize police in the front rank of homeland security, whereupon the former can be stood down almost entirely while the latter are thoroughly demilitarized and returned to firm state and local control. Second, America is threatened with the loss of her national integrity and identity, and possibly even independence, through tidal waves of illegal immigration. Again, no informed patriot questions this assessment. Neither can any American deny that massive illegal immigration demands fulfillment of the duty of the United States to protect each of the states against invasion, exactly fitting the constitutional paradigm for Congress's calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union and repel invasions. And absent remedial action by the general government justifies the states that are actually invaded or in imminent danger, as will not admit of delay, not only in mobilizing their own militia in raising regular troops and acquiring vehicles of war to turn back or apprehend the interlopers. Moreover, so extensive is the problem that only by calling forth the militia can the United States or any state possibly afford to put sufficient forces into the field. Third, America is threatened with economic, social, and political chaos arising from a source unknown to most people, the inevitability and likely imminence of monetary and banking crises. The inherent instability of the present systems of debt-based currency, fractional reserved central banking, and the incestuous coupling of the Federal Reserve System of private banks with the public treasury guarantees that crisis of national and even international scope and unprecedented proportions will break out at some time in the near future. When they do, money and banking will burst forth as critical issues of homeland security, as matters of both effect and cause. A collapse of the monetary and banking systems will impact homeland security because of its widespread catastrophic effects. Whether it involves hyperinflation, depression, or, most likely, the one followed by the other, 
A collapse will adversely affect every institution and individual in America, from the general government, states, localities, through private enterprise, large and small, to the proverbial man in the street, where, unfortunately, many may find themselves living on the edge of starvation. Although a fortunate few among the politically and economically well-connected will, as always, avoid the ravages of unemployment, impoverishment, homelessness, malnutrition, and disease, the vast majority will not escape some or all of these conditions. And everyone without exception will be exposed to the dangers arising out of the political radicalism and even violent revolutionary movements that will emerge from the rubble of economic breakdown and social dislocation. The causes of a monetary and banking collapse, too, will be traceable to homeland security, more precisely to the failure of America's self-selected, self-perpetuating political and economic elites to provide the homeland with the elementary security of a constitutionally of a constitutional monetary system, and to the recklessness and fecklessness of their international policies in the name of globalism, pseudo-free trade, and homeland security, too. America's present monetary and banking systems are inherently unstable economically, but if the Constitution were enforced according to its original intent, they would not exist to endanger this country. So at base, any future monetary and banking collapse will be the product of an ongoing conflict between the Founding Fathers' original intent and modern political and economic elitists' living constitution. In the monetary and banking field, this conflict has lain dormant for decades because the catastrophic economic consequences of applying the living constitution there have not yet become apparent. When they do, the situation will precipitate a constitutional crisis the likes of which America has not experienced since the 1930s, and possibly since the Civil War. At that point, Americans will finally recognize the necessity to conjoin the two greatest powers of government, the power of the sword and the power of the purse, simultaneously in we the people's hands. For in the social derangement of a major monetary and banking crisis, our country will suffer pandemic breakdowns of law and order, widespread domestic turmoil, and even open insurrections. In anticipation of exactly this type of extensive and intensive chaos, the Constitution expressly empowers the militia of the several states and only the militia of the several states to execute the laws of the Union and suppress insurrections, and makes them available to be employed in the service of the United States, to protect each of the states against domestic violence, so the power of the sword and the duty to wield it are ours. In addition, to restore the domestic tranquility and general welfare at which the Constitution aims will require rapid reformation and reconstruction of this country's failed monetary and banking systems along economically sound constitutional lines. This, too, will be a matter of executing the laws of the Union, starting with the supreme law of the land and suppressing insurrections launched by those special interest groups that have fattened off debt-based currency and fractional reserve banking in the past, and will not relinquish their profitable racket without a fight. So because under these circumstances proper exercise of the power of the purse will be a matter of homeland security, it must come within the militia's ken too. This will be not only appropriate, but also long overdue. For if during the last several generations, the militia had overseen execution of the laws of the Union as to these particulars in conformity with the Constitution's original intent, this problem would never have arisen. If Americans are at all foresightful and prudent, though, we will endeavor to reform our country's monetary and banking systems before a collapse compels us to rebuild those systems entirely. The militia of the several states can and should be in the forefront of this effort because, one, they have the ability. Comprising such a large portion of the population, they can exert decisive economic and political pressure at the local, state, and national levels. And two, and two, they have the responsibility, it being their constitutional duty to call themselves forth to execute the laws of the Union as best they can, if Congress neglects, fails, or refuses, to provide for calling them forth to prepare for the coming emergency. 
Surely we the people cannot stand idly by and suffer our country to be destroyed when we could defend it, because members of Congress cavalierly and criminally disregard their oaths or affirmations to support this Constitution as far as the militia are concerned. With the militia of the several states still not revitalized, the task of self-help will fall to the members of CHSAs. No one else will be ready, able, and willing to undertake it. Basically, the work will consist of three parts, education, legislation, and preparation. CHSAs should first educate their own members, public officials, and the general public as to why constitutional money and banking are necessary to Homeland Security and how to restore them. Second, promote interim legislative reforms such as a state electronic gold currency bill in order to provide a measure of local protection whenever it can be had. And last but not least, third, prepare for the worst eventuality by assisting their members and friends in becoming familiar with gold clause contracts and other devices for employing silver and gold as media of exchange in preference to and in the extremity of a monetary and banking collapse to the exclusion of paper currency emitted on the security of debts. Members must also know what state and local laws provide respecting militia, civilian law enforcement, emergency management, and homeland security, and why all this is insufficient for the task at hand. Before devising legislative proposals for revitalizing the militia of the several states, CHSAs must determine what the present laws already provide, where and why they may be inadequate, and what needs to and can be done in their state legislatures and local governmental bodies to rectify that situation. To this end, members of CHSAs should thoroughly familiarize themselves with all state and local laws, ordinances, codes, and regulations that bear directly or indirectly on the state component of the National Guard, state defense forces, militia, or any other military establishments or forces, police and other law enforcement and investigatory agencies, homeland security agencies with particular emphasis on those that maintain liaison with national agencies, emergency response, disaster relief, fire, rescue, medical and paramedical, and kindred agencies, and gun control in general, and how it applies to defense of self and community by common citizens in particular. Against this background, CHSAs should assess the strengths and especially the weaknesses of and lacunae in these laws, and determine how revitalization can correct any perceived deficiencies, augment, supplement, and complement marginally adequate provisions, and supply entirely new approaches to and methods for dealing with the problems the laws are meant, but fail adequately to address. End of chapter 9, part B.